Hello, what's up? Thanks for having me. Is this thing on? Okay. Yes, yeah, thanks for coming. My pleasure. My pleasure. So I wanted to start by talking about you being a guitarist because you are one of the best. You can be humble about it, it's okay. It's kind of um, and you've said that the electric guitar is a relatively new instrument on the planet. Yeah. And that we should not assume that the way it's being played so far is the only way that is acceptable to play. Right. And as someone who grew up studying classical music, um, when I hear you play, it makes my brain crazy in a good way. <laughs> um, all that non-conventional picking, tapping, you know, all the guitar effects. So how have you come up with such interesting noises, and how the heck do you make a guitar sound so cool with a pencil? <laughs> with a pencil. Uh, well, I started playing guitar very late. I started playing at 17 years old, and I had never heard of another guitar player that made an album that started that late, with one exception. That was Robert Johnson, and he had to sell his soul at the crossroads to do that. So I didn't want to have to go that route, so I thought practice might be the other alternative. Uh, <clears throat> and the best advice I ever got as a guitar player was uh, from a kid in high school who was more advanced than I, and he said, uh, if you want to improve, practice an hour a day, every day, without fail. And I took that as gospel. And I found that um, the rising tide of my playing was so noticeable when I did that, then I bumped it up to two hours a day, and then four hours a day. And while I was attending Harvard University, I was practicing four hours a day, 365 days a year, and over the course of four years, maybe missed a day or two due to like traveling or something like that. So um, if I had a you know, I studied till 1 a.m. with an exam the next morning. I would practice till 5, not till 4.58. Now, this is indicative of an obsessive compulsive disorder. You might be gathering and you'd be correct about that. Um, <laughs> but all that did was amass a certain amount of technique and ability that caught me up to some other guitar players who at the time were my heroes, like the Eddie Van Halens and Randy Rhodeses, who had a great deal of technique. I didn't have my own voice on the instrument. It was around the time of Rage Against the Machine where I self-identified as the DJ in the band and began looking at the guitar in a, in a deconstructed way and that it is just a piece of wood with six wires and a few electronics that can be manipulated manipulated in any number of ways and that could create sounds and then those sounds, even though they're unconventional, can be used as the building blocks for writing songs and guitar solos. So then that's what I began practicing eight hours a day was the eccentricities in my playing and the unusual stuff and rather than trying to cop Chuck Berry or Keith Richards or Eddie Van Halen, I would just try to play different sounds and whether it was um, the background music of a, of a public enemy uh, song or the scratching of a DJ or a lawnmower outside or a helicopter overhead and just by trying to when you practice that stuff it just you, you may not be able to sound like a lawnmower or a helicopter but you're not going to sound like Chuck Berry or Eddie Van Halen anymore <laughs> and so that once once the, like the, the blinders came off and, and then I had my own lane and I really felt like like I had found my own voice on the instrument and the horizons were pretty uh, endless. So what you're saying is you have to work really hard. Well, I mean, the part, there was the work part and there was the inspiration part. Like the work part sort of made my fingers be able to go where I wanted them to go. But that, it was sort of, the, it was the revelation that I didn't, it happened, it was a specific, there was a specific moment. My crossroads was at a gig in the San Fernando Valley. Um, and Rage, in the earliest days, we were opening up for two cover bands. And in these cover bands, in each of the cover bands was like a really shredding guitar player who had like a tremendous facility on the instrument. And I thought, I was watching them at Southside, and I thought, well, if there's two, like, shredding guitar players at this lousy gig in the valley, like on a Wednesday, there doesn't need to be three. And so I need, you know, <laughs> like, I need to figure out something that's my own to do, and that's when I started practicing other stuff. And, yeah. So you mentioned your guitar influences. Uh, Randy Rhodes, I guess you named your son after him? Yeah, Rhodes Morello. The reason why, the reason why Randy Rhodes was the guitar player for Ozzy Osbourne, for those of you who don't know, they sort of think it's, like, heavy metal thing, but he's a classically trained player who he self-identified as a um, as a musician first and as a rock star second. That very much appealed to me. Um, I grew up on like suburban heavy metal where the themes of the music were often either groupies or the devil, none of which you know was present in my mom's basement where I was practicing. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so, and, uh, and so the, the poster that was on my wall was Randy Rhodes, who was this, on days off from the Ozzy Osbourne tour, they'd be playing, you know, arenas and stadiums, but on days off, he'd take classical guitar lessons in whatever city they were in. And I really liked that kind of dedication to the instrument. That was my aspiration as well. Yeah, I actually was just seeing uh, a video on YouTube, obviously, of uh, Ozzy listening to the isolated um, guitar solo from Crazy Train. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that. And um, the, there's, unless you're not human, 
Like you, you have to get chills listening to that. Yeah. It's it's insane. It's like it's a very emo- a person had a lot of technique, but also sort of a, with a classical tinge and then a deeply sort of emotional and yeah. kick-ass way. So powerful, so precise, like fast. It's crazy. Um, so, um, so you mentioned that Randy uh, actually identified himself as a musician first. And uh, as much as I appreciate good musicianship. I grew up as a cellist, and I am sad that I never got to jump on stage. Uh, so, like ACDC or Kiss or whatever. So, what do you think makes a good musician, and what makes you want to jump on stage? Well, I can tell you about my first stage jump. Well, the first gig I ever had, I went to a small Illinois town, and, and there were three bands in my high school. One of them was Destiny, and they were beautiful men who played beautiful music, and they were adored by the entire school. They were kind of like the Beatles of the school. Their dating lives were insane. Then there was... <laughs> Then there was Epitaph, and they were much too mean to play at a high school dance. And they like covered Sabbath and ACDC, and you avoided them in the hallways, but admired them greatly. <laughs> and then there was my band. My band was the drama club-oriented band, and it was called The Electric Sheep. And uh, we didn't have the ability to play other people's songs, so we wrote our own music. Now, b- bizarrely, one of the members of that band is a fellow by the name of Adam Jones, who later surfaced in a band called Tool. We were in the same high school band together. Um, but so our first gig, we had... Um, audition for a show and we had to learn the song Born to be Wild. It took us four months to learn it very, very poorly. Uh, but we were in competition with Destiny this night and they had succeeded in their earlier performance. So they rolled us out and they played like a like a Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young song, of course. And then, so we were on a, a riser and the keyboard player that came in with the wrong chord to begin the song. Then the bass player, Adam, at the, who's a tremendous musician now, but he came in with the wrong note on the bass. And things were not going great. So I had like one trick up my sleeve and I could jump super high. So I like leapt off the riser and the roof came off the place. And and like it, it made me realize that perhaps there's more to rock and roll than playing the right notes. Perhaps <laughs> you have to be inhabited by like the Holy Spirit of rock and roll, which I felt that maybe I had some of that in me and maybe that would be my course moving forward. <laughs> That's great. Um, so your new album, The Atlas Underground, uh, just came out. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Yay. Thank you. Um, so I was actually watching one of your new music videos on YouTube, and the first comment was a very excited, all caps, explicit, which is basically how I felt uh, when I first heard some of the new album, uh, because there's so much, there's all this genre mixing going around. You know, you got like EDM and hip hop and guitar rock, obviously. And so was that one of your goals with the album to get people to listen to kinds of music that they don't normally listen to? The goal was a very lofty one, and it was to uh, forge a sonic conspiracy of diverse artists to shape a new genre of rock and roll, one that one that combines my Marshall Stack riff rock fury with big EDM drops and some of the electronic components of today in a way, a record that serves as maybe like a Trojan horse in 2018, where a lot of young people you know, are, gravitate more towards... Um, Ableton and, and computer com- composition for music and less practicing four, six, eight hours a day. Uh, and so part of my hope was to inflict uh, electric guitar playing on a new generation, but working with a really incredible cast from, you know, Marcus Mumford to Wu-Tang Clan, from Rise Against to Steve Aoki, Bass Nectar, K Flay, um, Vic Mensa, Knife Party, there's more pretty lights. It, like there's a list of, like sort Barry of Clark Jr. Yeah, yeah, a uh, very eclectic awesome. mix. Um, but with the overall vision of this this kind of the north star guiding it being to make a new kind of rock and roll that without compromising at all on the guitar playing or on the political content to make music that would um serve a new generation awesome and uh you mentioned all these people amazing artists that you're that you collaborated with uh was what was the most challenging collaboration and why uh, well, there's a song called Every Step That I Take, which is a collaboration with Portugal the Man and Weathen, who's a um, teenage wunderkind EDM producer. And that song I wrote with Matt Schultz from Cage the Elephant, and Matt got very busy. So it took quite a while for that to, to get a final mix of that one, but it's actually the song that has kind of maybe done the best out in the world. And we're partnering with a great organization called SAVE, which is a suicide prevention organization on this song. And, and my good friend Chris Cornell passed about a year and a half ago. So it was very important to get this song right and to make this song one that would um, sort of be a, a, a fitting eulogy for him and to provide material support for people who are suffering from depression or suicidal thoughts. Yeah. and. A lot of us have or are currently suffering from uh, mental il- illness issues, and it's nice to see people trying to work to demystify that. And uh, 
and encourage people to get help. So uh, you're working with, say, what exactly are you hoping to do with them? Yeah, well, I mean, part of it is the demystify and making it, the, taking the stigma away from mental. Like if you break your arm, you go to the doctor to set the, to set the arm. But if there's something wrong in your, if something doesn't feel right in your mind, often even bringing it up. I mean, I, the, the people of my parents' generation were so, you know, there was a lot of, depression and things like that. They would never touch it with a 10-foot pole to try to seek help. Uh, but now, hopefully, if there's any silver line to some of the passings that have happened in the, you know, the, both in people's lives and in the entertainment industry, it can be to sort of demystify that. And have, there, there is help, and whether it's friends, loved ones, or professional help, uh, or this great organization, SAVE, you can reach out to for help at any time. So. That's cool. And uh, so this song became a tribute to Chris. Yeah. It was not written as a tribute to Chris, but okay. it's been, it it was, it's uh, okay. kind of pushing it forward as a way to, you know, uh, make suicide awareness something that is at the forefront of this record. Just him as a talent, can you tell us what you learned from working with him? Sure. I mean, Chris Cornell was a, uh, he, he was, well, one of the thing that I learned in retrospect, uh, now that he's passed, is that he was a, per, you know, as a singer of Soundgarden and, as, and Audio Slave, and in his solo career, he had deep dark personal demons, but he managed to harness them for 52 years to make some of the greatest rock and roll that ever was made, you know? And so just kind of watching that process was one to, it was awesome to stand next to his rock godly self with his incredible voice and his incredible hair. And it's like his whole <laughs> vibe was just so like perfect. Like, how are you, you're blessed, son. You're, um, but just to be in a band, him and also his, uh, his effortless composition of of melody, like you give him anything, you give him a complicated, heavy riff or a simple two chord chord progression, and he could make make it flower into something that's really beautiful. Um, are there any other artists that you haven't worked with that you would hope to work in the future? Yeah, I'm actually sort of already started on part two of this Atlas on There's about half a record done. I don't want to give any of the names away because it's not done yet. But uh, but yeah, there's it's I like I love the idea of challenging myself as a guitarist and as an artist to get so outside of my safety zone. And the thing about this record that, that uh, there's two ways to make great great music. One is um, a collaborative effort with like a band where you, chemistry is what's important and. Together, you're able to, through your combined efforts, to create something that none of you could create alone. That's one way. The other way is, is purity of like a, a solo record where you have a vision. Imagine like sort of the early Dylan records of Bruce Springsteen, where there's a, like a unified, like there's one person's vision that is fulfilled and it's undiluted from the outside. What I tried is to get like the best of both worlds on this record, where it's a on this record, I'm a guitarist, I'm a songwriter, but I'm the curator first and foremost. Is to following both a uh, thematic and um, and musical vision, but getting the benefit of the of the crossover collaboration on each of the tracks. Each every one of the twelve tracks has at least one collaborator on it, and allowing that chemistry to flower in ways that were very unexpected to me. Cool. So no spoilers yet for part two. No spoilers for part two, but okay. there's some good metal and some very surprising stuff on it. Yep. Okay. Um, so uh, I wanted to ask about how music may be changing. It's always evolving and when I see companies like give some guitars for example going bankrupt yeah. do you think that that makes uh, that means that composers are moving away from guitar and other classic instruments and kind of moving towards computers and synths you know well, that, more I mean, so yeah like I would say um, what's happening yeah, almost obviously yeah. that's so the case, that's yeah. what you're trying all, to all you have back to, all you have to look is like the the Spotify charts and all that, and it's it's you have to look really hard to find anything that has any guitar in it in, in it whatsoever. I think that the, my my theory is that it may have something to do with the way people listen to music now. And a lot of music is listened to on a laptop or on a phone, where two com two musical elements don't sound great. One is kind of um, like distorted guitar, and the other is like open hi hat. So there's like sort of a tinny quality. I, my uh, uh, fella in my one of my bands has teenage sons who despise. The rich catalog of music of Rage Against the Machine and Audio Slave, and they have a, and they have a, and they have a scathing review, of like a a, 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 a review of it that is just has caused me endless sleepless nights. <laughs> they just, they describe the music of compared to the music they listen to, they describe the music of Rage Against the Machine and Audio Slave as small music. <laughs> yeah. And if you don't understand that, it means you're of a certain age. <laughs> and if you do, you're like, I, I see what they're saying. But no, it's, 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 just, it's, it's just very interesting. Like the way that music is delivered to them, like on their phone, Cardi B sounds huge, but perhaps the Evil Empire record, you know, which was recorded in a 
room one tenth the size of the one we're in now with a lot of like shimmery, you know, overhead. Maybe it sounds different. So, but anyway, like I said, with this record, one of the I'm trying to take elements of 2018, but infuse them with a direct injection of rock and roll guitar playing to take back, take the power back, literally. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I mean that. How does that translate to uh, live performance, right? Because um, I know you kind of had a sort of art installation type. Yeah, yeah. Type this show the, going we're, on right there. now I'm doing sort of a promo tour, which is kind of a glorified listening party where um, we listen to the record and then I do some guitar demonstrations. But in 2019, we're putting together a tour for the Atlas Underground, which you know, on a record that has Wu Tang Clan and Rise Against and Marcus Mumford, it's unlikely that all 20 collaborators will be at every show. So the, the glass half full way of looking at it is let's make a show where there, you will not miss any of them by having the show be so different and challenging and immersive. And so Sean Evans, who's the um, artistic director for Roger Waters, The Wall, and the Us and Them tours, we're putting together a, a show is not even like a, it's part kind of art installation, part presentation of music that will have both a lot of guitar shredding, but a lot of ideas in it that will make it a really fulfilling evening, even if all the collaborators are not present. Cool. Something to look forward to. Sounds exciting. Um, so you posted a photo on your Instagram of your hand surgery, which is was looked gross and awesome at the same time. <laughs> um, did you injure yourself playing? And what, what yeah, is there was, anything we'll inside say, your We'll just say it was a vacation accident. Uh, <laughs> that's as much as I'm willing to divulge. And uh, But no, but modern medicine is no joke. Like I... I, I fractured the fourth metacarpal on this hand, which is, you know, of all the guitar playing fingers, it's probably the third most important one, right? Uh, and I broke it on a Thursday, uh, had surgery on a Saturday, uh, and and played a show in Stockholm, a 90-minute set on Tuesday. Uh, so there's, they just put a big old titanium plate in there, nailed it together, and the, the doctor, the doctor, I literally have a fistful of steel, like I've ever, like Wolverine or something like, you know, like, <laughs> it's really, it's, it's like a Wolverine claw. Adamantium, right yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, adamantium, thank you. Right. Sorry, nerd. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, no, that's, I, I respect, <laughs> I respect nerddom, boom, there we go, all right. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm in the I'm of the Trek village myself, so don't yeah. yeah. Uh, but no, that it was uh, pretty amazing, and and the doctor just said if you can, I'll it, you're not going to hurt it any worse. I'm going to nail that thing together tight. If you can withstand the uh, you know the discomfort, it's going to be fine. And if one thing I do have is a good deal of will, so the shows went pretty good. Well. The one thing I had to keep reminding my bandmates because the shows went so smoothly was like what a hero I was that we were all didn't cancel the tour. <laughs> Like, I have a broken hand, and we're playing today, all right? So, <laughs> I know so, it looks effortless. So your hand's more metal now, actually. It is. My hand, I am more, I was metal to begin with, but I'm <laughs> much more metal now than ever before. Um, so if you had to pick one, Eddie Van Halen, Randy Rhodes, or someone else? Or someone else. I mean, my, my guy is, is, like, for the reasons stated, was, uh, is Randy Rhodes. Like, he just had that, there was, like, a, an intelligence to his playing and a passion to his playing that's kind of my number one. Yeah. Okay, um, so with Atlas Underground, um, uh, you seem to be kind of pushing the boundaries of what music can be, right, and what we're used to listening to. Um, are you hoping to make a larger point about how we maybe, you know, change the status quo, you know, in society, just sure. as how we see people, it's like that it's okay to be different. Sure, you know? sure. I mean, this record has artists of uh, diverse genres, diverse ethnicities, diverse ages, and diverse genders, and that in and of itself is a statement in these very divisive times. Um, also, the lyrical, the, the thematic thread that runs through the record is social justice ghost stories, and the idea that the heroes and martyrs and fallen of the past can uh, inform the struggles of the present and hopefully light a beacon towards a more just and humane future by giving voice to these to the voiceless. Uh, I actually have a question from a Googler that couldn't be here. Uh, he wants to know what was a bigger moment for you, the Cubs World Series victory or playing with Springsteen? Those are two pretty hot moments right there. <laughs> <laughs> I was equally nervous for both, frankly. I'd have to say, you know, I, I love my man, the boss, but the Cubs thing is one that I never thought I'd, never thought I'd get. 
That was sweet. <laughs> Though I was super like like Bruce Springsteen and I. You know, we played together for over the course of six years, and we'd been friends for years before that. But it's he's unique among my friends in that I subscribed to two fanzines about him, and once chased him down Sunset Boulevard trying to kiss his head. So that's like a different lane of peer. Uh, but. Uh, <laughs> But no, I'm playing with Bruce for the first time in 2008. I was really, I don't get nervous for much in, in music anymore, but I was just, I'm a huge Bruce Springsteen fan. And the idea of being on stage with the E Street Band, you know, in front of people and playing the song, like with me singing with Bruce Springsteen and like playing it, it was pretty crazy. And the, the, there was a bit of a drama on that particular night, much like game seven of the 2016 <laughs> World Series. Um, <laughs> the end result was in doubt in both of those. Uh, Bruce had said, we're going to do Ghost of Tom Joad. So I learned, um, he said, learn it acoustic and electric. So I learned the version from his acoustic record and was ready to play it, felt pretty good about it. And I heard the band rehearsing upstairs at the Anaheim Pond, as it was called then. And they had changed, Bruce had changed the key of the song. He raised the key about eight steps. So now it was out of my rich milk chocolate baritone frame. And also I couldn't transpose the chords that I had to play with the band like in, you know, in three minutes and I had to trans now transpose it. To, I just, that's not my forte. And so I was really nervous. So I walked up there and we're going through the song and I'm fumbling. I'm fumbling. I'm like, I can't play the chords right. I'm not hitting notes. And little Steven, who's the, his consigliere in the band and very nice fella. He recognizes my, that I'm distraught. He's like, baby, baby, it's going to be fine. Baby. Ba I'm like, baby, it's not fine. There's nothing fine about baby right now. <laughs> it's, baby's super anxious. So Bruce Springsteen, they don't call him the boss for nothing. He recognizes the, what's going on, my anxiety. He puts his hand on my shoulder, looks me in the eyes, and says, Tommy. First of all, Bruce Springsteen calls me Tommy, which is <laughs> so dope. And he's like, Tom, <laughs> um, Tommy, we're going to do it in this key, and it's going to be great. I said, well, that's easy for you to say, Obi-Wan. But, uh, <laughs> I, but then I, then I, at the end of the day, I thought, well, can I sing a song of social justice? Yes, I can. Can I play a kick-ass guitar solo? Yes, I can. So are there 14 people in the E Street Band who already know the chords? Yes, there are. So I'm not going to worry about that part. So I went downstairs, made my way through half a bottle of Jameson, came up, and we blew the roof off the place. <laughs> and Obi-Wan was right. It did, we played in that key, and it did turn out great at the end of the day. So. Obi Bruce. Yeah. Um, so Rage is nominated for the to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So they tell me. And uh, I worked in the music industry, and I still don't know how that it works. Yeah. And uh, you're on the committee, so can you explain to us how it works? And did you nominate yourself? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for, first of all, much like like when they choose the Pope, there's no there's no divulging how it actually works in the room. But there's there's a there's a committee that 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 fights passionately for. The, you know, the artists that they put forward, I did not put forward Rage Against the Machine, but I was pleased that someone else did. Uh, the, and then you, you fight for, like, you advocate for yours, and there's a lot of voting, and it's like a sort of Byzantine, you know, voting scheme that eventually we wind up with a ballot of 15 names, which is the one that was announced the other day. Uh, and then it goes to a wider votership of about not eight or 900, um, and then five or six get in. The, the thing that's the thing that's great about the, the rock. First of all, I was I was an opponent of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Like I, as a kid, I grew up playing baseball, and as you know, when you're in your first year of T-ball, you dream of one day having a career that would be great enough that you could enter the Baseball Hall of Fame. In rock and wind, as a guitar player, as a rock guitar player, I thought the Rock and Roll Hall, Hall of Fame didn't have any of my favorite bands in it. Like I, why would I want to be in that? It doesn't have anybody I like in it. So I. John Landau, who's Bruce Springsteen's manager, and I spent a lot of time on tour with him, I relentlessly pounded him about how the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame stunk. And I'm like, you need to, like, it's not, it doesn't represent, like, an entire genre of music. And to his credit, he heard my pleas and he let me in the room. And since then, a number of bands, including Stevie Ray Vaughan and Rush and Kiss, that were very deserving of being in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, have gotten in. And others have been nominated, like, you know, Judas Priest and whatnot. But anyway, but it's, it's taken a step in the right direction. And now I think that anybody who does pick up a guitar with aspirations of being a rock guitarist can be proud to be nominated for the Rock Hall. And I mean, it's similar to the, I guess, any sort of music award show, right? Like the Grammys, like they um, don't seem to nominate a lot of metal bands. And I'm a metal fan, so. Yeah. So thank you yeah, for I'm doing that. Yeah, I'm doing my best. <laughs> best. Um, can you think about your best and worst performances? 
Sure. Um, the worst performance is pretty, there's been a few, but the uh, worst performance is, it comes to mind immediately. Uh, Rage Against the Machine was ascendant in 1993 or 94, and we were playing the Reading Festival in England. It was our first time jumping from club shows to, we weren't headlining, we were playing later in the day in front of 60,000 people, and our music in England at the time was like on fire. And so there was a great deal of expectation. And I had worked out a new like like guitar redefining trick on the guitar where I take out the jack of the guitar and then I tap it to the metal on the guitar and it makes like a noise and then I manipulate and it's like and minds are going to be blown and this our reading performance is going to be broadcast not just all over England but all over Europe it's like the Rage Against the Machine hour right so and I've got and I'm ready for my moment during the solo and bullet in the head and the TV camera zooms in and I unplug the jack now what I don't realize is that the power what makes it happen is some grounding that makes the steel jack go like this but the but the but the power in England is different than the power in the United States <laughs> So while I've been blowing minds all over the United States, I, w there was no sound check for these shows. You just show up and play. I mean, I, so with the cocky confidence, I walk to the front of the stage as the camera zooms in for my heroic guitar redefining moment. I unplug the jack, I touch it to the thing, and it goes <laughs> <laughs> The camera's getting closer, like, well, maybe it's still coming, and I'm like, And then I just sheepishly plug the guitar back in, <laughs> take a few steps back, and play a couple of Chuck Berry licks. <laughs> that wasn't my best. That wasn't the best one. That wasn't the best one. Uh, I mean, I've had I've had a lot of a lot of really really great moments on stage. One of them was like when Rage Against Machine played in Finsbury Park in 2010. Somehow there had been this. Facebook campaign to make a 17-year-old Rage Against the Machine song number one on the pop charts. It was up against like Simon Cowell's X Factor. I don't want to go into the details, but it's, it's like every year at Christmas, the X Factor in England, Simon Cowell's show, has the number one song. And in England, it matters. They, they gamble on the number one song like they do on the Kentucky Derby. It's like it's a huge deal. And everyone on Christmas morning sits down and listens to the top ten. And the number one is celebrated wildly. And every year for the last five or six years, it had been the winner of the TV show, The X Factor, sang some syrupy, horrible song, and that was guaranteed to be the number one because it was promoted widely by Sony and everything else. So a couple in suburban London was sick of it, and they started a Facebook, came, Facebook campaign to make Rage Against the Machines Killing in the Name, to put that forward, a 17-year-old song with 16 FUs and one mother flipper in it. <laughs> and, 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 Without the band's involvement in any way, soon the Facebook campaign had you know 500,000 people on it, and it was it was huge. And we were just going about our lives, kind of not even being a band. And so we we heard about it, and we decided to get involved and, at the last minute. And you know we played a we were on the whatever the Good Morning America of of Britain was, and they said whatever you do when you pl perform the song, don't do the cussing part. And we thought. The cussing part of the song is, fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. <laughs> so sure, we won't do it. <laughs> so, so, you know, like the Good Morning America, it's the big special for the Christmas thing, and we go on and we play the song, and there's like, I don't know if you're familiar with something, there's like sort of like the quiet fuck you part, which is like kind of whispered, and then the big fuck you part. And so, and so the quiet part, Zach doesn't do it at all, and the, and the censors are like re relaxing. And then when it comes in, he just tells England, fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. And of course, you know, that helped spike sales. Uh, <laughs> and with, um, and, and it became, we had the number one pop single. It was the most downloads in a week in the history of the UK. And we defeated the thing. And we, one of the things we promised to the fans there is if we did have the number one song, um, we would play a free concert for all of England. So we, at, we, they, they wouldn't let us in the nicer parks around London, so <laughs> it was a bit of a reputation. And they uh, so Finsbury Park is where we had it. Uh, it was cordoned off for forty-five thousand. Another forty-five thousand jumped the fence. There were almost a hundred thousand people. We played a free show, and we finished the night playing "Killing the Name." And it was just like a beautiful night of like, like it really was like the the manifestation of the band's ideals like came to fruition. It was not the band that did it. It was fans that really like took the power back in a way that, in some ways, it's sort of, you know, it's just a, it's just a number one thing. But it, it demonstrated that by kind of standing up in your place and time for something you believe in, you can change, you can overcome great odds.
That is great. Thank you so much for well, sharing that. So good. Um, so um, I'm going to ask you one more question, but uh, then we're going to open up uh, audience questions. So please think of some good ones. Um, don't embarrass us. Um, so uh, you mentioned you're doing like a sort of part two. Um, is this, uh, are you doing another album that you're collaborating yeah, with? Yeah, another, or, or, another or record of, of, diverse, of diverse collaborations that continues to try to push my guitar playing and musical artistry further and this in the same in the same genre of like taking artists that i admire and with in unusual combinations and making music that's very challenging and exciting but is guitar based cool i uh, looking forward to it so who wants to go first so we have this oh. Oh, wow. hello is this working yes. so i'm gonna throw this at you who was it you that is such a okay. google invention right yeah. there <laughs> <laughs> that is full google um, I was wondering what music you're listening to now. What's on your playlist? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I love the Interrupters now, which is a great kind of ska band on Tim Armstrong's label. Uh, I listen to a lot of music in the car with my kids, and so it, it, it jerks wildly between Metallica's Master of Puppets and the Hamilton soundtrack. So it's a, <laughs> with, a, with a good deal of clean version Cardi B thrown in. That's all. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm a huge fan of Rage Against the Machines music. I love metal music, and I also love electronic music. Yeah. And I tune in to watch the Ultra Music Festival live stream every year. Yeah. So one of my favorite groups, Knife Party, yeah. when they close out their set and bring you out to this gigantic crowd to wow them with this explosive guitar playing overlaid with dubstep and this crazy kind of electronic music. How'd that feel like for the first time? Yeah, that was, I mean, that was really the first, I, I was a, an enemy of EDM music. I uh, thought it was, I knew it only as Italian taxi cab music or, <laughs> or like Ibiza yacht awfulness, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, until a metal friend turned me on a knife party who, who is in the EDM genre, but I felt the same aggression and tension and release as in my favorite rock and roll. They were the first people that I reached out to and said, "What? I have an idea. What if you do what you do and we replace some of your um, synthesizers with my electric guitar? The idea being like if my electric guitar is the Ansel Adams clear black and white photo, I want to hear the smashed Picasso version, something that's recognizable, but recognizable, but you hear it in an entirely different way. So standing at Ultra Festival, which is like 135,000, you know, 16 year olds who are wasted, right? Like <laughs> we're wearing nothing but glow sticks. That's what it is. It's in, in Miami. It's insane. So, so, so which, which is my usual audience, right? So, um, so, so I go out on stage to play this, so this, it's the collaborative song Battle Sirens, which is on this new record, but we wrote it some years ago. That was like maybe two or three years ago. Um, and so I go out on stage and I'm ready to rock. And then I notice that their crew as an EDM they, they've never mic'd an amplifier before. So there's no mic on my amp. So there's like a PA system ready to not hear me. And I'm headed towards like another moment, right? So, uh, so fortunately, at the last minute, they did put a mic on. And if you, you, know, if you check that out on YouTube, it's a really awesome like, m moment in collaboration. That, was, that really made me think that there was something in this. You know, so thanks for being there. Thank you so much yeah. for the answer. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, I've uh, been a big fan of Rage Against the Machine, obviously, for a long time as well. Um, seeing as you're so interested in, in unusual sounds and things like that, and a lot of rock musicians have moved in this direction, have you ever been interested in doing film film music or television music? I, I've done I've, oh, I've done a lot of film in the past. Yeah, I scored a, uh, did the rock score for two of the Iron Man movies and have appeared on a number of uh, soundtracks and scores. One of the things that I, I did a couple of Michael Mann movies as well. Um, and while it's a, I like the... In, I like it in theory better than in practice, because one thing when you, when you do music sco scoring, you have something that you don't have when you're a band, and that is you have a boss. And you have someone who like, wants to hear it sadder. And I'm like, what do you mean sadder? Like, <laughs> like, you, have these, like you have these sort of directorial geniuses who you know, like, do not have like, sort of the, the musical vocabulary to help to guide you. I did one, I forget it was, I did a, a score for a movie that I, I don't know if I ever saw at the end of the day, it was for uh, a team. It was like the Mr. T rebuild. Anyway, and so we spent so much time on that. Like they're just 
it, it needed to be cut. It was this 12 minute sequence and it needed to be everything completely spot on. And they'd send me back with the vaguest directions back. Like it needs to be sound more like, you know, it's played on an oasis in the middle of an atoll. And I'm like, oh, okay, we'll get right on that. Yeah. yeah. So you know, just like turn the bass up a little. Like, I don't know. <laughs> so finally we made it sound like the atoll. And, the, and, uh, and so, you know, the movie comes out, and when I see the movie, they've taken this 12 and a half minute musical piece that was meticulously tailored to the film, and they just put it in an entirely different scene. <laughs> <laughs> just like intact, just in a different scene. I'm like, I guess the Atoll music goes there. So, anyway, <laughs> I'm open to it, but it's not, it's, I'm, not, I'm not seeking it out. Got it. Got it. Got it. Any other questions? Just a couple up front here, one back there. Yep. Sorry. Yep. Sorry. Um, so, in high school, I remember there was this year or two where these really pivotal, pivotal albums came out. Um, Nevermind, Ten, Rage is Self-Titled, Bad Motor Finger, yeah. right? All of these. Can you talk a little bit about how much you were trying to change mu music sure. in that era versus sure. like? Sure. Sure. I think that it was. It had less to do with. Uh, uh, trying to change music and that the music industry had a revelation with the with the Nevermind record and maybe the Pearl Jam 10 record that they they didn't know best what was connecting with audiences and they stepped back from sort of the over a and ring and trying to mold artists into stars and going we don't understand Tool or Nirvana or Rage or Nine Inch Nails but whatever they're doing is connecting so get get step back from it um, I was in a band before Rage Against the Machine called Lock Up, which is kind of like a uh, uh, living color style funk rock band. And we got a record deal, which was, I'd never met a person that had a record deal before. And so we were very, very excited. Uh, and we did everything that everyone asked us to do. They Like the A&R person made these suggestions, the producer dampened down some of the weirder parts of my guitar playing. I'm like, well, I guess they know best. This band Lock Up also had probably the worst album title in the history of Western music. I'll share it with you now. The record was called Something Bitchin' This Way Comes. <laughs> and yes, that's bitchin' with an apostrophe. <laughs> so we weren't off to a strong start. Um, but that band was summarily dropped and all the cliches that happened, the dickings that happened to bands happened to that band. And at 27 years old, I was done. I had my grab at the brass ring and I had failed to be an album maker or a rock star. So I made a vow to myself that I'm never going to play another, if I'm not, if that's not going to happen, I'm never going to play another music, note of music that I don't believe in. And that's when I started writing the riffs for the first Rage Against the Machine record. And, and was very surprised. Like that was a band that there was not a commercial, there was not a, like, <laughs> there was no radio station or, or record store or club in Hollywood that was booking a neo Marxist, multi ethnic punk rap metal band and we made we made those songs in a complete vacuum of ambition you know and we just made songs that we loved and believed in and then much to our surprise you know that was what connected with a global audience but there's a lesson in there that's <laughs> that's very thinly veiled can you please call one your next album something bitch in this way comes? oh jeez it's, <laughs> it's already there yeah. <laughs> A first shout out, I'm from Chicago suburbs as well. I saw you got Rage at Lollapalooza 3. Oh, uh, which suburb? Um, Darien. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's down south, so yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so my question is, what is with the Hippo Pegasus? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, the, uh, it, it, the image is one that fe feels to me like it has, it's as a gravitas and a weight and a power to it. It also has a beauty to it, and it's a combination of unexpected elements. And all those three things I see as representing the music on the record. I also have loved hippos since I was a kid and went to the Brookfield Zoo. You know what that is. Damn right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, Tom, yeah, thanks for yeah, uh, finding the time to be here today. Sure. Uh, so I'm a singer from Ukraine. I've been doing rock and metal, and I had a cover band when we, when we did uh, Killing the Name Off. But Ukrainian audience know English enough to ask us not to do that anymore, <laughs> like in the, in the pubs. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'm... <laughs> So my question, so I have two questions. So basically, I'm now, I, we just moved a year ago. I'm just learning the business here. Sure. And I have a full-time job, obviously. Uh, so I have a budget of five hours a week. And I'm trying to choose between basically getting better, mm. the songwriting, and mm. building a brand on YouTube. Oh, wow. So how, yeah. would you, how would you balance that? Wow. Yeah, well, I would say, first of all, first of all, welcome. And it's one thing that's sort of crazy is it's how many metal dudes there are at Google and, and women there are at Google. I, that's pretty... That's pretty interesting. That was a little bit surprising. Uh, 
in a in an awesome way. Uh, no wonder it's such a successful company. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the first thing I would say is that the, the the rules of how music is made and and um, distributed to the world are so radically different from when I moved to Hollywood in 1986 that I I you know my kid's babysitter boyfriend is a YouTube star and I just don't have any understanding of even what he does. I don't know. <laughs> no idea what that dude does. Um, so maybe that's the best route. <laughs> um, but I mean, the, I would say I, my recommendation to you is in order to be, a, it's very, very easy to be a success by a certain criteria. And that is if you play and write music that you love and that you enjoy, whether or not there's an audience, you will have an artistic satisfaction that is there, let me tell you, there are people who are playing stadiums that don't have that, and they do not sleep well at night. I know them, and that's true. And but then there are people who, have, you know, jam in their basements on the weekend with friends that have a fulfillment via music that is what music is really all about. So the path to success in 2018, I can't counsel you on because I just I really don't know. But the path to like being like having fun and and a, a very meaningful experience with music is one I would say write songs that you believe in and play guitar you know or play songs that you really love and enjoy it to its fullest a uh, quick question um, what was the first effects pedal or processor that kind of got you going and yeah you know with experimenting yeah 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 um, uh, I w remember walking to the Highland Park music store and when I could afford an effects pedal and I turned on the delay pedal and it had like I just turned every knob all the way up and it sounded so super freaky and I'm like that's the most awesome thing that's what most guitar players do is when you get a guitar pedal you, you think that's awesome and then you dampen it not like you make it more subtle and you go for like oh I want to just a nuanced this that and the other and I never lost sort of that feeling of let's do the crazy thing and try to experience that same you know to make people's ears freak out like my I did when I first turned that effects pedal on in my in my setup I have a very it's a very limited number I've embraced um uh, limitations with regards to the equipment. I have the same four or five effects pedals, some of which I bought at that. Th that effects pedal may be in the running there uh, as an alternate. Uh, but but my idea was to take a very limited amount of gear and, because I never liked the sound. I, I, when I first got my first check, I was working for a United States Center. I got my first check and I went to a guitar shop in Hollywood and they custom made a guitar for me. And I didn't know anything about which fretboard so it was a stinker it was like an expensive horrible guitar and over the course of some years I replaced every bit of the electronics and the neck and I never got it to sound like the sound I had it had in my head and so one lockup rehearsal I was fed up with it and I took this amp that I had and I, and I said I got it, this is as good as I can make it sound I'm unfulfilled with the sound I marked the settings on I said but I'm never going to think about it again because I felt so much of my creative time was being expended chasing a tone and I thought, this is just going to be my sound, and now I'm going to write song. I'm going to be create with this. The, t the markings on that amp, it's the amp that I used at the show last night, they haven't changed since 1988. Every song I've ever recorded, every song I've ever played live is with many of those songs, with that guitar that I didn't feel fulfilled with, and with that, those amp settings. And one more sort of lesson to draw, Rage Against Machine, we were practicing for a South American tour, and we had to do it on rental gear. And we were playing our normal Rage songs, but on not our own gear, and it sounded bad. And so the, the Brad, the drummer, said to me, um, are we really so dependent on our gear to sound good? And I thought, that's possible, but it's also possible that if we had started with this gear, we would have written songs that sounded great with these sounds. And so I think that just not worrying so much about what the tone is and worrying about what your creati creativity can be is what would be my recommendation. Cool, thank you. You're welcome. One more. I think it's back to Ukraine. Oh, you may, you, you may get to ask your last question. There you go. <laughs> the Ukrainian delegation. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm doing a lot of open mics right now. So what is the next? I know you, you it's hard for you to remember maybe, but what is the next level mm -hmm. after open mics, but sure. before actual like, sure. I'll 2000? I did. I, th uh, first of all, I think open mics are great. When in the height of Audio Slave's fame, I was doing open mic nights. I, I have a... Uh, uh, I made four records under the name The Night Watchman, which is like an acoustic folk troubadour political kind of Woody Guthrie, Phil Oaks thing. And on days off, I would go and do open mic nights. And again, in those experiences, I found playing three songs with a you know latte blender whirring in the background was really fulfilling. You know, it was like I was communicating and and it was playing 
stuff that I felt was true and I was, you know, fighting for my artistic soul in these coffee houses. So I'd say there's nothing wrong with just playing the open mic nights. Um, I would say if you want to go beyond that, a key way to get better, uh, two ways to get better are to play live, which you're doing, and to play with other people. That's a crucial component is to, whether they're better than you, whether they're worse than you, just the, the chemistry that you get, the collaborative experience is one that will probably be fun and you will certainly learn from and will improve your own playing. Well, everyone check out the Atlas Underground. It is out now. Thank you so much for being here, Tom. Thanks very much. And your thoughtful questions. <laughs>